Hopefully it's not me. There we go. Wow. Good morning, everybody. It is so great to be with you. I am so, so excited. It feels like it's been a minute. It's uh, been, I think now this is the, uh, they've had three people speak before me, so it's the fourth week, and so um, hopefully I do okay. I mean, I don't know. It's like, hopefully like riding a bike, right? Once you get back on, you just keep rolling with it. So, but you know what's interesting? Today um, marks an anniversary. October 22nd of 2020 was my first Sunday as the lead pastor, and that is today. Um, some of you are clapping like, oh, really? It's been that long? I'm like, yeah, it's been that long. But it's been an, an amazing journey. I am so thrilled uh, still every day to be your guys' pastor, to be one of your pastors. Thank you for the love, the support, the encouragement. Um, it's so awesome to see what God has been doing in our church. Out of curiosity, I wanted to ask you guys to do me a favor. If you were here that first Sunday that I gave my very first message as your lead pastor, raise your hand. Okay, look, look around the room. Just look around the room. Now, okay, thank you. Put your hands down. If you were not here that first Sunday, put your hand up. You see what God's doing, you guys? It's not because of me. It's because what God has been doing, and it's awesome. And I thought, you know what? What a better way than to do that same message again. That's not true. I'm not doing it. <laughs> We're actually in the book of John. Open up your Bibles to John chapter 12. Um, it was awesome as we walked through John 11, and as we did it slowly, um, we took each section, and some people were even giving me a hard time and saying, man, the main part of the story is Jesus raising Lazarus. Like, let's get to there. And I'm like, well, let's chill out because in our lives, sometimes we need to see what God is doing in each season or each step of our lives. And I loved how we saw that God worked through the delay and how he challenged our faith through the delay and how we, God even did that with our visas going to Papua New Guinea and how all that worked out. And then God then reveals his glory and his compassion. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing in the resurrection or the raising of Lazarus. And obviously there was different opinions on that. And Pastor Jim last week covered that. Jesus steps aside and goes out into the wilderness not to walk again amongst the people. But now, as we're going to see in today's text, Jesus begins probably the greatest week in human history, the week leading to the cross. And so I pray as we see this, it, it's crazy because John 1 through 11 was basically two and a half years, almost three years of Jesus' life. Now, John 12 to 21 is basically a week long. And so it's crazy to see what is all in this last week of Jesus. Let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into God's word. Father, I thank you for the privilege, the honor to be able to stand in front of your people and share your word. So, Father, as Aaron prayed, I pray that all of our hearts would be open, that your word, when it goes out, would not fall on the hard soil or the rocky soil or the soil where the weeds come up and choke it out, but it would fall on the good soil of our hearts. And then, Lord, we would be fruitful because of you in our lives. So, Lord, help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, John 12. Verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was 
filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who, he who was about to betray him. Now, we have to remember, obviously, John wrote this after it happened, so that's why we get insights like that. Said, this is Judas, what Judas said. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Verse 9, when the, large crowd, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, Many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Everyone is devoted to something. Every one of us will spend our money, our time, our talents on something. Everybody's devoted to something. You know, you have your friends that are super devoted to health, and they're always talking to you about, hey, you need to eat this you know, type of food, you need to exercise, you need to do this, right? You have those friends who are devoted to hunting. They're always talking about their new gun or their new bow or their new camo, whatever it was, you know. You have those guys that are devoted. You have, like me, those that are devoted to amazing sports teams that keep losing, but I'm still devoted, right? I'm even, I even texted our brother after um, we got swept by the Arizona Diamondbacks. I'm a Dodgers fan, and I texted my brother, and now everybody's like, oh, the, Richard, today's your third anniversary. There won't be a fourth. But anyways, so, it's like everybody is devoted to something. We're, we, we get all passionate. We get excited about the things that we are devoted to. I want to look in our text today, and I want to look at three options of things that we, things or people that, will, that we can be devoted to. Now, some of us as followers of Christ, we're going to say, hey, if we're really, really devoted to Jesus Christ, this is what my life is going to look like. This is what I should be doing. If you're really devoted to Jesus, maybe you'll be a missionary in a foreign land. I mean, we just got back from Papua New Guinea, right, and, and seeing the sacrifices and the devotion that those missionaries took. And then we look at that and we say, oh, well, that's really sold out. That's somebody that's super devoted. I want to encourage you. It's not just because of our location that determines our devotion. And so let's look through our text here and see what these things are that we can be devoted to. It says in verse 1, six days before the Passover. John here is date or time stamping what's about to happen. He says it's six days. The greatest week, as I said, that Jesus is going to begin when he walks and he takes the courage to begin that walk to the cross. And you're like, well, Richard, yeah, that was his point. That was his purpose. But yet it still took him courage to walk to the cross. Because why? As much as he was 100% God, he was 100% man. And I think some of us, when we look at something that could be, well, maybe God's calling me to be devoted to this, but we lack maybe some courage. Jesus here, we see he's going for it. He knows what he set apart, and he's going to begin it. And he, it says, before the Passover. And as we know, the Passover is the celebration, the feast of them being set free from the bondage that they were in in Egypt. They spread the lamb's blood over the doorpost. The, the, the angel of death passes over that, and God delivered them. 
Well, much like this, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus is now coming to the cross or beginning that journey to the cross to free us from the power of death and sin. We are free from the power of sin and death. The two things that man cannot free himself from, no matter how hard we try. So here he is. He's coming to Bethany. He's about, it's about two miles outside of Jerusalem. He's in the area where Lazarus, whom it says, whom he raised from the dead, is there. And so they gave a dinner for him. And even this act of giving the dinner for Jesus was a sense of courage and bravery for those people. Because if we remember, we, we remember in uh, John eleven fifty seven, 57, the Pharisees and the religious leaders are saying, hey, anybody's got to tell us where Jesus is. Otherwise, you're basically an accomplice. You ever been somewhere and got busted for something you didn't do, but your friend did? This is what they're doing. They're putting their neck out on the line and saying, hey, we don't care. We care for Jesus, and we don't care what you guys are saying, so we're going to stick our necks out on the line. And I remember for a while, I, I don't know if it's going around too much anymore, but I remember when I was younger, it was kind of popular, and people were all the time asking, would you die for Jesus? If somebody put a gun to your head and say, denounce Jesus, would you die and I would say, yes, I will die. And I remember one time I was at this rock concert, and we were there, and it was a Christian rock concert. It wasn't like a Judas Priest or anything like that, Iron Maiden. Anyways, it was a Christian band, and we're there, and the guys got all fired up. All the people are yelling and screaming and clapping and having a great time. And then the dude gets up there, the lead singer, and he says, who here would die for Jesus? And everybody's like, oh, you know, screaming and yelling because they're all fired up. They're all devoted. And then he looks at the crowd, and he goes, you guys were all excited about dying for Jesus. He goes, who here wants to live for Jesus? And it got so quiet. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? Don't, don't we want to just, we all get, again, with our devotion, we think it has to have this passion and this fire, this excitement. Well, how do I show that I'm devoted every day and just living for him? And the way that I interact with people at our mission field in Walmart or bashes, or Starbucks? How am I showing my devotion there every day? Something else that's weird, and, and, and you guys have got to know me over these three years, of when I was thinking about they threw this dinner for him, why are they throwing a dinner? It's a celebration of them raising, of him raising Lazarus from the dead, and I started thinking, I can understand a dinner for somebody that uh, you just celebrated their birthday. Like, hey, happy birthday. Let's have a cake and we'll have some candles and we'll all get excited. Or somebody that's retiring and you're like, yeah, good job, quitter. You know, whatever. Like, you, you get all together and you get all excited about celebrating this dinner. But this is the whole thing of what do you do when you celebrate? Man, you raised somebody from the dead. That's awesome. Like, what gift do you give for that? I don't know what it's just like that's the thoughts that come to my mind I'm letting you guys into my weird mind but anyway so they throw this dinner now let's look at this reaction so they gave him a dinner there Martha served every time we see Martha in the scripture what is she doing serving that's how she shows her devotion to Jesus by serving. Then it says, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. What was Lazarus doing? Just chilling. And some of you guys are like, typical male. <laughs> Just sitting there while the women are all running around serving, right? The guy just got raised from the dead. Maybe that was a hard experience. Maybe he needs to rest. Maybe he needs, man, I don't know. I've never been through something that hard. Maybe he just needs some time off. Here's what's crazy, though. We will look at somebody, and we will say, wow, they're really devoted because they're serving. We will judge that, right? Then, in the same regard, we'll look at Lazarus, and we'll say, that guy's lazy. Lazy Lazarus not doing anything 
How about that there are seasons in our lives where we just need to recline at the table with Jesus? That there are times in our lives where, man, I served. I was out doing something, and this season of my life is a time that I just need to recline at the table. And I pray that you would not feel the guilt of yourself or the guilt of others for sitting and reclining at the table. I pray you won't stay in that season all the time. Oh, no, no, I need a season. No, you don't, bro. You've been in that season for a long time. Get up. Do something. But yet, we need to recognize those seasons. All right, let's now keep reading. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The first thing that we see in this text, and I pray that we would recognize it for our own life, is that we can be devoted to Jesus. And you're like, well, yeah, Richard, that makes sense. You're at church. You're supposed to say that. But yet when you look at each person's thing that they did, it was different. And yet we all think, well, if somebody's really devoted to Jesus, this is what their life must look like. That is such a lie from the enemy, and it's a way that the enemy gets in there and tries to cause division within our church. We, as the body of Christ, need to recognize that we're all gifted in different areas and different things. Martha, her identity was to serve. Her gift was serving. And every time, there, there might be some of us in here who feel like, man, I'm just not doing anything unless I'm serving. Unless I'm getting up and actually serving somebody, then I'm not devoted. One, I pray that you would, if that's a lie from you've been hearing from other people or the enemy or yourself, I pray that you would reject that. But if that's also, though, your gift, then run with it. Do it and be fully devoted in that with Jesus. Lazarus, like I said, he's in a season of just reclining. And I pray that we would be in those when, and recognize when, rec, excuse me, recognize when we need those. We think that we're being ungodly or unholy if I rest. Yesterday, um, we had our Bible study for our bike ride, and so we went riding and up, up in Sedona and the, the, the group that gathers. And you know what I did the rest of the day? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I said, you know what? I looked at Heather, and she goes, hey, what are our plans? And, you know, what do we want to do? And, and I started thinking, oh, we can go for a hike. We can go do this. And don't, don't get me wrong. I love, I love getting out and hiking, and I love doing that stuff. But I said, you know what, babe? I'm just going to take the day off. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to recline at the table. Actually, I reclined on my couch in my lazy boy and watched football. But <laughs> I'm telling you, I pray that you would recognize those seasons when you need that. It's important. And don't hear it from others that you're not doing or you're not devoted. But Mary, we look at Mary. And man, we think again, as even... As we look at Martha, we're like, oh, we should be see serving. Or we look at Mary and go like, no, that's really somebody. Yes, she was. It says in the other Gospels that this story, actually Mark says it, that she will be remembered for the rest of their days. And it's always going to, this is story is one of the only, there's only two stories mentioned in all four Gospels. This is one of them. And so then we, we try to put then Mary up on this pedestal of who she is, or we put missionaries, or we put other people that are like, wow, that's so amazing what you've done. But I think we need to be careful with that. But let's look at Mary, what she did. She took a pound of expensive ointment, something that she'd been saving, something that it cost her. And she put it on the feet of Jesus. Then it says, she wiped his feet with her hair. First of all, most of us would have been like, that's disgusting. I don't want to touch anybody's feet. Maybe I'll touch Jesus, but nobody else's. 
She does it. Then she undoes her hair. Which in our culture, that doesn't mean what it meant in their culture. For a woman to be in public and have her hair down was a disgrace. It was, means she was a floozy. Yet here she didn't care. Again, you, I want you to think about who's at this dinner. There's a lot of people that have heard what Jesus had done. She worked her way up there, got to his feet, poured the ointment, and then began to wipe it, not caring what anybody else thought. She was devoted. She was sold out for Jesus. It doesn't mean that she did the best thing ever, but yet, because I, I want us to think about this. We look at that and we say, well, yeah, maybe Jesus really loves Martha and Mary. I can get that. They, Martha served, Mary did this anointing. Lazarus, ah, he's just chilling. He's not doing anything. When we read through John 11, and we did that lesson, that whole, we spent four weeks in that. How many times did it say that Jesus either loved them or they loved Jesus? It said it a lot. It didn't say Jesus loved Martha and Mary and he was okay with Lazarus. That's what we can look at and say, oh, yeah, if I'm really devoted, then Jesus loves me more. Or if I'm devoted in this way, then Jesus will love. No, Jesus loved them all the same. Because I serve doesn't make Jesus love me more. And because I recline doesn't mean Jesus loves me less. Jesus' love for us is unconditional. Here's the thing. As one of your pastors, my heart is not to get you to do more religious activities. My heart, and I want you to listen to this, my heart is that you would become more devoted to Jesus in whatever way he calls you to, whatever season of life you find yourself, that you would be okay reclining, that you would be okay sitting at his feet, that you would be okay serving when it's your season to serve, but that whatever it is, not more religious activities, but more deeply devoted to Jesus. When we look at even their devotion, we can see some things. One is it costs something to be devoted to Jesus. It cost. They, they, with Mary, obviously a very, very expensive ointment. With Martha, it cost her time. And you're like, Richard didn't cost Lazarus anything. Maybe he got sore, I don't know, from sitting there. <laughs> Maybe. But it also could have cost him what? Persecution. Because, oh, why are you just sitting there? Get up. Do something. This is something else that their devotion, it affected others. Their devotion affected others. Martha, with her serving, blessed other people. Listen to what it says about Mary's devotion. Listen to what it says. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Her full devotion, full surrender to Jesus affected the whole house. Other people were blessed by it. Something else, though, is persecution will follow the devotion. It always does. When you make it your aim in your life to be devoted to Jesus, trust me, persecution will be right behind it. Because listen to verse 4 now. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who he was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii, denarii and given to the poor? She here is being criticized for her devotion. How many of us have ever been criticized for our devotion to Jesus? 
I know I have. I say, hey, I'm going to do this. And people are like, Richard, that doesn't sound wise. And I say, well, then you don't know me that well anyway, so that's okay. But I do it anyways because I'm devoted to Jesus. I'm not devoted to the wise thing of this earth. I'm devoted to Jesus. But here's another question. Yes, we've experienced that persecution. How many of us have ever persecuted somebody because their devotion looks different than yours? How many of us have ever said, wow, that person's devotion to Jesus is crazy? They need to tone it down a little bit. They need to do this. They need to do that. They shouldn't be going and doing this. They shouldn't be going and doing that. I know that when I am being critical of other people's devotion, what I need to do is do self-reflection. Why am I being critical of their devotion? Is it because I am jealous? Is it because I feel that they're just trying to show me up? You guys know I'm very competitive. There's all these things that run through my mind. But that's crazy is that we can be just like Judas. We can say, oh my gosh, what you just devoted, you just wasted it. You wasted it. It should have been used for something much greater with have a greater impact. I want to encourage us as a family of faith to not criticize others with their devotion. There's going to be people that, and I said this that very first Sunday too. I probably should have used a different word uh, that Sunday, but I said, get ready for weirdness to come through these doors. But what I meant is, be ready for people that are different than you to come through these doors. Because that's what I want. But then what do we see of Judas? Let's look. What was he devoted to? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used used to help himself to what was put into it. Judas was devoted to oneself. He was devoted to himself. In our culture, in our society today, They try to tell us, look out for who? Look out for yourself. Look out for numero uno, right? There's some of my Spanish, just letting you guys know. Um, Always look out for yourself, because if you don't, nobody else will. That's not what Jesus is teaching us in his word. When Judas even said it's worth 300 denarii, do you know what that equivalent was during that a year's wages for somebody he's criticizing what she's doing and saying you wasted a year's wages on anointing jesus feet but i'm telling you when you are sold out and fully devoted to jesus it doesn't matter the cost you're going to do it and what's crazy is judas was criticizing her for that in a few days He's going to sell her out for 120 denarii. Less than half, he's going to sell out the Lamb of God. And yes, it's God's sovereign will that it happened, but yet he's criticizing this, and yet later he's going to do something even for less. Something to look for when you see that somebody is devoted to oneself is They will be very, very critical of others and their devotion. Don't do this. You shouldn't be doing that. The person, another thing to look for is the person might sound and appear righteous, but they're not. What did Judah say? We should have given the money to the poor. How many of us would argue with that? None of us. It sounds like the right thing to do. It sounds religious. It sounds like he's, he's doing a good thing. But in reality, what? No, he wanted to dip his sticky fingers into the money bag. So be careful when somebody is devoted to themselves. They're going to be very critical. And then they're going to sound religious. What's crazy to me and scary. This is super scary to me, if I'm honest. Judas spent two and a half 
three years, basically, with Jesus every day. Saw him do countless miracles. Heard him teach multiple times. Even things that we don't have in Scripture. And yet, it didn't even have an impact on his life. Think about how often you've been sitting in a church setting. Is my life different? than from the first day I walked through a church door? Is my life impacted? Is my life transformed? Because it's not always about being close to Jesus. Now, I love that, yes, we need to be close to Jesus, but being in the produce section doesn't make you a banana. That's close to that banana. It doesn't make you one. Same, I'm, oh, I'm going to get up in which... Man, I get up every morning and I read my Bible. But if I don't let the, and I love it, in our bike group, we're going through the book of James. And this, in chapter one, it says, receive with milk, meekness, not with milk, with meekness, the implanted word which is able to save your soul. But then don't be a doer, or excuse me, a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. How many of us have heard the word, but it's never impacted my life. Judas is a prime example of that in this scripture. Look at verse 7. I love Jesus' response to her, to him, excuse me. Jesus said, leave her alone. I pray you hear that when you hear others criticizing. Now listen, if somebody's coming alongside you as a brother or sister, and they're encouraging you to maybe think about your devotion, if your devotion is unbiblical, then yeah, don't reject that advice. But if your devotion is solid and it does not contradict God's word or his character, then I pray you would hear this. Leave them alone. Let, you can say that to them, the people that are criticizing you, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Again, Jesus had been talking that when he goes back to Jerusalem, he's going to die. Listen to verse 8. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. What I think about when I read that verse is that there could be a priority to what we're being devoted to. Jesus was only going to be with them a short time, but he's saying, I'm going to be leaving. So think about this in our culture. How does that mesh with what we're doing? We're only going to be here a short time. There's no need to evangelize in heaven. We need to do it now. We need to be devoted now so that others can see it and be impacted for the kingdom of God. That's what we need to be. And I want to make sure, too, one thing I think is very, very important is don't substitute our service forever just by sitting at the feet of Jesus. If you can sit and rest in his word, do it. Don't say, oh, I'm too busy because I need to go do this, and I need to go do this, and I need to go do this. But for you, God, but for you, no, sit at his feet when you can. Let's keep going in verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came. Man, can you imagine how fast that news would have spread? Jesus is here. The guy that raised Lazarus from the dead, he's here now and back in our midst. So they come. They learn that Jesus was there. They came. Not only on the account of him, meaning Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. What does that say? Does your life speak of the impact that Jesus has on your life? Lazarus obviously was dead and raised from the dead, so you're like, well, that's a huge transforma transformation. Maybe I don't have that cool of a testimony. I wasn't dead, and I became back like spiritually we were dead now spiritually we're alive but yet Lazarus living was a testimony of Jesus's goodness 
Your life, is it a testimony of what God has done? And will it lead other people to come and want to see you, meet with you, because what Jesus has done? So they do. They go and they see him. Verse 10, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Remember earlier I said Jesus, Lazarus was just chilling, reclining at the table? I said he'll get persecution. They want to kill him. Not because he was sitting at the table, but because of what his life meant. So what were they devoted to? They were devoted to the religious system. Their religious system. They're saying what Jesus and the life of Lazarus is doing is messing up with my comfortability, my, my money, my authority. We got to get them both out of here. Think about that. Lazarus had a miracle performed to him on him. Now his life is threatening the religious system. My previous church, I told you, be ready, because I want people that are not like us to come in through these doors. At my previous church, there were same-sex couples that would come to the church. They would come in holding hands, sitting next to each other. Some of you guys are like, that is disgusting. That is gross. We need to judge them. We need to condemn them. I agree that what they're doing is not God-honoring. But I also want to say, is that, are you devoted to Jesus? Or are you devoted to your religious system? Are you devoted to Jesus that says, love them? Or are you devoted to your religious system that says, let's keep them out and let's kick them out? Man, did you should have seen, I had people come up to me at this previous church. Richard, those people do not belong here. Richard, those people shouldn't be here. We should kick them out. You guys have heard my story. Some of you have, some of you haven't, about the, the lady that was in a same-sex relationship and engaged. They let her keep coming to church. She was in a class of mine. I led her to the Lord, and she denounced that lifestyle. But without them being able to come in here, they would never get that. So we need to be devoted to Jesus, not a religious system. Now, some of you are like, Richard, it's the same thing. I think they mesh. But I think sometimes we fault, and I'm saying we, we fault on the religious system more than we on the love of and the grace of God. And I pray, though, that we would mesh the two in the sense of the truth and grace. That we would never, I don't ever want, as your pastor, lead pastor, to say we're going to compromise the truth. We're not going to do that. But we're going to love them with the truth. And that's my heart. And I pray as you are sitting here thinking, where is my devotion I pray you would be thinking my devotion is to Jesus and to love people just the way they are. Help them speak truth, but be devoted to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that our devotion would be set for you not set on the things that make me comfortable, the things that make me happy, but our devotion would be set solely on you. And Lord, were the things that do make me uncomfortable that we would look and contemplate, am I just doing it because I'm devoted to this religious system or am I devoted to Jesus and I want to love? Help us not to be like Judas, who spent time in your presence, but was not willing to be impacted by your word. So, Lord, help us to love in grace and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen.